Our first speaker at Barfest 2018, London edition, is Pietro Salvi, who is a fourth, who has two friends in tonight's, <laughs> and is a fourth year physics student at Imperial College. He's desperately searching around for a PhD, including in his description. He's, <laughs> he's a little nervous that his research this year for Barfest has placed him on a number of watch lists. Oh. <laughs> To find out why, put your hands together for Pietro. Ladies and gentlemen, it is two and a half minutes to midnight on the doomsday clock, the semi-official measure of how close we are to Armageddon. Apologies to anyone in the audience who thought I meant in real life, there's still quite a lot of this show left to go. <laughs> We see evidence of imminent Armageddon in climate change, with cyclones increasing in intensity and frequency every year, alongside skyrocketing global temperatures. Tensions are also at an all-time high, with the threat of nuclear winter omnipresent despite the words of our most calm, collected, and most authoritative world leaders. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not all doom and gloom. Recent studies have found that nuclear winter the effect by which ash from the fires of nuclear weapons clouds the sky and reduces Earth's surface temperatures has much more of an effect than we previously thought. In fact, it looks like if we could just get it just right, <laughs> we could completely undo global warming. <laughs> With the benefits of nuclear winter now well established, there are only a few things left to consider. <laughs> First, where should we drop the bombs? <laughs> Taking into consideration that we don't want to bomb too many people and that we want high forest density to burn to produce the ash necessary for nuclear winter, we can combine population density maps as on the left and uh, forest density maps as seen on the right to find three candidate areas. North North America, <laughs> Siberia, and the Amazon. <laughs> now, there are a few reasons we don't want to bomb the Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, as a major source of water, we don't want to poison everyone's water supply. Um, but secondly, like the second reason is quite important that there are many, many dangerous animals living in the Amazon. And, well, irradiating these like, seems like a terrible idea. <laughs> there is one final bearing issue with the Amazon, as can be plainly seen on this fire frequency map. It's already on fire. <laughs> all the time <laughs> and we still have global warming <laughs> what a waste <laughs> this is down to the heavy rainfall that we get in the Amazon that knocks the ash from these fires right out of the sky making it completely useless for nuclear winter <laughs> however both North North America and uh, Siberia the other two candidate areas have very low fire frequency and rainfall intensity the solution here is simple we fight fire with fire Given that we want a low frequency of dropped bombs, we can just sync up our bombings with these far northern forest fires. We might as well use nuclear bombers to reach these places, since they're far and difficult to reach. And, well, they're already on fire, so we may as well burn them up properly. <laughs> Granted, for Siberia and Alaska, this isn't a problem, as... <laughs> <laughs> Russia and Canada can bomb their own countries as much as they'd like. But we also want to harness the vast empty forests of Canada. Unfor uh, fortunately, in-depth political analysis reveals that Canada has been embroiled in a long, -term, a long conflict with Switzerland and Sweden for top position in the world reputation rankings. <laughs> Since Canada will want to keep its uh, position, and this provides them with a clear advantage over their main two rivals, <laughs> it is clear that they'll offer their forests for the greater good of humanity. <laughs> The 
the final issue we need to deal with is the estimated death toll due to the sudden drop in temperatures and related effects uh, on crop production. Well, while it is true that the estimated death toll for this is uh, somewhere in the billions, <laughs> with a simple paradigm shift, we can see that this translates to a much more than reasonable survival rate. <laughs> In conclusion, to outline the main benefits of this theory, much money would be saved with tens of billions of dollars spent by the US alone finally being put to good use. And <laughs> not to mention that red button urges of presidents around the globe would be satisfied. <laughs> Furthermore, this theory, in contrast with previously world leading theories, actively undoes global warming rather than just mitigating it. I'll at least for a few hundred years while we use up our stockpiles, which should be more than enough time for us to figure out how solar panels work. <laughs> but most significantly, perhaps, this is the most effective proposed method we have for achieving nuclear disarmament. <laughs> because what better way to make your safe world than by using up all our most dangerous weapons? Thank you. Well, that felt like a pretty comprehensive talk. I can't see how there's any room for questions at all, but <laughs> if any of our judges have a question. Well, as a Canadian. <laughs> I, I really want to be nice about this and, and very polite, and, uh, but no. <laughs> uh, do you have a particular part of Canada, or is it just Canada in general? Um, I feel like we should avoid Quebec because we should avoid the places that gave us nice food, at least. Hey. Um, <laughs> sorry, that wasn't meant to be mean, but... <laughs> if, if you're about to say the big empty bit in the middle, I'm actually from the big empty bit in the middle. <laughs> the big empty bit north of the middle. Uh, <laughs> I bet that's all right. Thank you. So, uh, as an economist, I'm, I'm always looking for private sector solutions rather than... <laughs> Kind of heavy-handed state intervention, and um, <laughs> so so the leading economist on on the use of nuclear weapons is Thomas Schelling. He won the Nobel Prize in, in economics in 2005, and he predicted in the 70s that by the 1990s, uh, some terrorist group or other would have got hold of nuclear weapons and would either have detonated them or would be using them. For, uh, for purposes of extortion. Now, like all economic forecasts, that was wrong. <laughs> but, like, like most economic forecasts, you feel it's going to be right sooner or later. So do you not just feel we should just sit back and someone's going to let a bomb off sooner or later? Um, that, is, that is definitely uh, an optimal, optimistic view of the world. Um, <laughs> um, I'd actually like to give a different prediction. I think Elon Musk, with his space travel, uh, I don't know if you've heard about using nuclear weapons and the shockwave from that to launch people into space. Um, <laughs> really, I feel like there's going to be a synergy between Elon Musk and the heavy-handed state intervention. Win-win. Round of applause for Pietro! Yeah.